walking in the morning daylight or going outside in, in early morning daylight has been shown to be really helpful for resetting our circadian rhythms so right. that we sleep better at night. Uh, and and we also just feel a little more um, awake, you know, for the tasks we have to do during the day. Hey, we've got a great episode for you this week with Florence Williams. She is the author of The Nature Fix and Heartbreak, A Personal and Scientific Journey. She shares a ton of insight of her years of studying the impact of the natural environment on our well-being and our physiology. She's traveled to Japan to study the forest bathing there. She's been to Finland and Scotland and Wales and uh, across across the globe looking at the studies and personally experiencing the positive impacts uh, of being in nature. Uh, she gives uh, a ton of tips on what you can do to get more nature in your life, no matter, no matter your current lifestyle. So let's dive in with Florence Williams. <laughs> Welcome to a, another episode of Being Human. I'm delighted to say I am here with Florence Williams. She is a podcaster. Uh, she leads wilderness and nature-based retreats in the US. She's an author, the author of The Nature Fix, which I have read and absolutely loved. Uh, she's also the author of Heartbreak, A Personal and Scientific Journey, which was the winner of the two 2023 Pen Have I missed something there? Pen Award for Writing? Pen Award in Science Writing. Pen Award in Science Writing. Uh, and a brilliant writer, I must say. As I said to you, Florence, before I came on, you made me laugh at least four times in the book. And the book has changed my behavior in at least two ways, uh, which, is, uh, which is high praise for, for any book. So I'm delighted to have you here. Uh, I can't wait to get into uh, all of your your journeys and explorations in what it means to be in nature and how it helps us. So very warm welcome, Florence to, Florence, to the show. Thank you, Richard. It's great to be here. Yeah. Um, so for people who haven't heard about you, I would love uh, for our audience to hear a little bit of your backstory uh, before you came to be writing books about uh, being in the wilderness and, and having your heart broken. Uh, it would uh, be yeah, awesome to to get some of the from the early Florence to where you are today. Yeah, sure. I, I've been a science and environmental journalist um, for a long time, <laughs> a couple of decades, um, mostly doing kind of long form articles for magazines like Outside Magazine, where I'm a contributing editor, National Geographic, um, publications like High Country News, which is an environmental magazine here in the US, um, Smithsonian, you know, Scientific American, places like that. Um, and I started writing books about, I don't know, 15 years ago, I've written uh, actually three books now. And they've all been um, more or less about what I'm interested in, which is sort of the hidden connections between human health and the environment. Right. And did you grow up as a kid with a nature lust? Uh, did it start you know, it's there? Funny. I actually grew up in New York City in Manhattan. Um, but close to Central Park, which is, you know, one of the great parks of the world designed by Frederick Law Olmsted. And, um, you know, I was, I was probably in the park, like almost every day, uh, as a teenager, riding my bike, playing soccer, um, you know, jogging. <laughs> and, um, my dad was a big wilderness guy. And so right. every summer, um, we, we were sort of the original van life people. We would load into this 1979 Dodge van with two canoes on the top <laughs> and a couple tents inside and a mini fridge um, and drive out west. And so we would go canoeing on these wilderness river trips um, in places like Montana and Wyoming and Colorado. So, yeah, it definitely got in my blood. And then I moved out west after, after college. Right. And and did your so so you said your your scientific interest was in the connection between sort of the environment and aspects of yeah. human well being. So is that where so where did your is that what you studied? You first studied when you got to college? 
What? No, not really. I mean, in college, I uh, I was an English major, so a lot of literature, uh, but I was a minor in environmental studies. Um, but in those days, it was mostly policy and economics, uh, things like that. Not a lot of science. Um, it wasn't until I started writing more about the environment um, that I actually got a little bit bored just writing the sort of classic environmental stories of like what's wrong with the logging companies and what's wrong with the mining companies and what's happening to air pollution. Uh, I was interested in what did this actually mean for our cells? What did it mean for our um, you know, babies? Uh, what did it mean for our psychology? Uh, and so that's when I started getting a lot more interested in the science because I started being becoming interested in learning about human hormone systems, for example, how pollution affects that, how pollution affects our reproductive systems. Um, and then uh, on the good side, you know, how being in nature can help our psychology. Right. And, and what were some of the first discoveries you made then that really kind of got you hooked to go deeper into this connection with, with well-being and nature? Well, um, about 10 or 12 years ago, my family moved from the heart of Colorado, uh, from the front range of the Rockies to Washington, D.C. And even though I had grown up on the East Coast, you know, I had spent 20 years in the mountains. And so I felt this huge psychological shift in my own mind for the worse. I mean, I got really stressed out <laughs> making this move, you know, to a big city. And there was a lot of noise pollution, um, there was a lot of air pollution. Uh, you know, there were these traffic circles that you're all familiar with in the UK. Um, roundabouts, we call them. Yeah. We call them roundabouts, exactly. Um, you know, and I, I, I got more anxious and I wasn't sleeping well. I, I got depressed. And I started to really think about the ways that our, um, our internal landscape, you know, gets reflected by our external landscape. And how did that environmental psychology affect us? So around that time, I was also assigned an article for Outside Magazine uh, about the power of being outside and sort of what the science has to say about it. You know, we had heard of this term nature deficit disorder, which was coined by a journalist, Richard Louvre, who wrote a book called Last Child in the Woods. But I was interested to know, like, if there was scientific evidence to this, you know, this idea that when we spend our lives indoors, which we increasingly do, um, you know, what the impact is on our physical health and on our emotional health. So that's what I set out to investigate for outside. And it kind of blew my mind because there was science about it and a lot of emerging science just starting up um, as scientific tools were sort of evolving. So we could now take for example, portable EEG caps that measure brain waves out into the field, where previously a lot of these nature experiments had actually had to be conducted in a lab by mm -hmm. showing people photographs. Now we could actually wear these EEG caps in different environments, see what was going on in our brain waves. Um, other neuroscientists were doing imaging studies, uh, looking at activation in certain parts of the brain. All of this was just really starting to happen about seven years ago, uh, you know, when I started writing the book. And so, um, you know, after that article, I ended up getting an assignment from National Geographic. It was a cover story called The Power of the Parks, uh, very similar. <laughs> and in those days, National Geographic was really interested in what the rest of the world was doing and had a big travel budget for reporters. So they sent me to, you know, all these different countries. Um, and that's when I realized, you know, there's really a book there. Right. Yeah. And and going back to that first article for the, for outside, what 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 was it that you first discovered when you were given that opportunity to look at the, the science? Yeah, yeah. So I, I had to really figure out where there was ongoing science that I could witness. Because as a reporter, you know, I want to see it actually happening in real time. Um, and eventually I found some ongoing studies in Japan. And they were um, really interesting studies measuring people's physiologies. So um, basically taking groups of people out into what they call forest therapy trails in Japan. They have a term um, for it, don't they? Well, uh, shin... Yes. Well, forest shin, bathing. Shinrin yoko, yo is that right? Really exactly. Yeah. That's kind of what they were doing was this forest bathing, shinrin yoku, but on these designated forest therapy trails, 
which are not something you know that we call you know we don't we don't use that terminology in the U.S. Um, so I thought that was kind of interesting that Japan has really embraced this as kind of a population wide wellness intervention, right? But but a number of studies coming out of Japan um, showing that people's cortisol stress hormone levels drop when they're outside in nature that their nervous system really enters, you know, a a calmer, uh, more balanced state. So um, respiration slows, um, heart rate variability shifts in a way to indicate a more restorative state, um, more of a rest and digest part of the nervous system, as opposed to fight or flight state that many of us are kind of in a lot during modern life. Um, and also people were reporting in these studies that they felt a more positive mood after being outside. They were having fewer thoughts of anger and frustration. You know, when I first heard about this, I was a little bit skeptical because I thought, well, they're exercising, right? These people are walking around in the woods. Um, and by the way, a lot of these changes were being found after just 15 or 20 minutes of being outside Mm. and they're away from work. They're away from school. Um, but the researchers were trying to control for that by sending groups to also walk around a city intersection or a downtown city area. So they were walking the same distance. They were away from work or school for the same amount of time, but they were really only seeing these positive restorative changes after being in the forest. So right. that was that was really what I ended up writing about was this kind of forest bathing. Um, and that article came out a while ago. It was like 20. 20- 13, I think. And, uh, you know, since that time, of course, forest bathing has become very, the the article went viral. Um, I think they called it something like take two hours of pine forest and call me in the morning. Uh, um, (laughs) And now there are, you know, thousands of guides uh, who have been trained outside of Japan, uh, including me. I went and got training during the pandemic, which was fun. So I now lead forest bathing. (laughs) Right. And what was your first, ex- did you, did, did you go to Japan and experience Shinrin Yoku? I did. Just talk us through that then. Talk us through your first experience of forest bathing. Yeah. So, you know, it was interesting. I mean, Japan has some really beautiful national parks, um, beautiful hardwood forests. Um, there are a lot of Hinoki cypress trees there, which um, scientists are also studying. And I ended up reporting on some of that for the story. Um, where uh, immunologists, for example, like Dr. Ching Li in in Japan, is um, actually measuring what's happening to our immune cells when we're in the presence of these tree compounds, these aerosols that smell wonderful. You know, I sort of describe it in the book as a combination of Christmas tree and vapo rub. If you know what vapo rub is, it's that. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, I can remember it for kids. Yeah, on your chest. If you. Yes, it's this yeah, really yeah. lung clearing, right? Mm. Invigorating. Yeah. Um, but it turns out, and and what and what you know that after being in the woods for a couple of days, um, our killer T immune cells increase about thirty three percent, and those are immune cells that are really important for fighting viruses. Uh, they're important for fighting cancer, um, and all kinds of of illnesses, trees seem to emit these aerosols also as an immune defense, right? So they help protect the trees from fungi and so on. So it's really interesting that they also seem to act on the human immune system. I, that blew my mind. Uh, who would have thought? And, and uh, you know, so, so one of the ways Dr. Dr. Lee sort of figured this out was he, he actually basically locked people in hotel rooms for three days. And in half the rooms, he misted the Sunoki cypress oil in a mister. And in half the rooms, he just misted water vapor. And then he analyzed people's immune cells. And again, it was like this big increase, significant increase in immune cells in the people who were exposed to the Hinoki cypress essential oil. Uh, and the, the immune cells stay elevated for up to 30 days although most elevated for seven days. So his advice to me, which I'll pass on, was if you can get into the woods once a month, you know, that's good for your immune system. And if you can get out once a week, that's even better for your immune system. 
Right. And, and I talked about behavior change for me, but one of the things that I bought, a, uh, you know, a mister for my room and I put Cypress essential oil in it. The, yeah. The problem I, have I got like around that, I think, that I, I, think I need to get a more expensive one because it's a bit loud. <laughs> and I can't sleep because the mist is too loud. Well, in Japan, it's so funny. They actually make products like Hinoki toothpaste. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Shampoo. Like it's, you know, they're really, they're really going for it. Right. Um, but the, but the experience itself, because I can imagine people who are just hearing that term for the first time. And I know when I first heard the term, I was like, what, you kind of get down in the leaves and like rub yourself with grass? <laughs> I mean, like, what actually is it? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you don't have to take your clothes off. Um, really, it, it's almost like sunbathing, forest bathing. And, and the, the idea is that you're a somewhat passive um, kind of um, experiencer of this environment so you can move through the woods usually quite slowly in the traditional kind of forest bathing experience you can sit next to a tree um and and the idea is to really open up all of your senses so typically a guide will kind of just cue you through this you know close your eyes take some deep breaths um what are you hearing you know, let's focus on the sounds of the woods or whatever nature environment you're in. It doesn't have to be a forest. Um, and then there are different um, kind of invitations to also smell wonderful things. Um, you can go on a little wandering expedition on your own for 15 or 20 minutes and, and just notice the different textures uh, around you in this nature area. So by doing that, by opening up our senses, you are actually rejuvenating your mind because you're what it does, and, and the neuroscience studies have kind of shown this, is that by, by becoming more sensory and more aware of our senses, we're actually kind of dimming down the activation in our thinking executive function brain. Mm. Um, not something we get to do very much in daily modern life, right? Where we're like so task oriented and we're stressed out and we're ruminating. Um, so we kind of open those senses up, uh, and it makes us feel wonderful. You know, our, our bodies are designed to be sensory. They're designed to read natural environments, right? I'm so interested in how, for example, our perceptual systems evolved to feel at home and to read a natural landscape. You know, we can look around a forest landscape and say, oh, there's clean water, um, here's an animal track. I'm going to follow it this way. Um, you know, I smell rain coming, right? That's how we evolved. And so the theory is that when we take our sort of modern selves and we go out into the woods on some deep subconscious level, we just feel at home there because our perceptual systems know how to deal with this landscape as opposed to the roundabouts where yeah. we actually have to shut down stimuli in order to focus on getting to the other side. So for example, if you're listening to the BBC and you're driving in a roundabout and there's a kid crossing or a dog crossing, you know, or a truck coming, you're not, you're not actually hearing what's going on on the BBC at that moment. You have right. to filter it out. Um, our brains get really exhausted by doing this kind of constant filtration. You know, we don't want to hear what's going on in the office behind us. We don't want to smell the, the smells of, you know, Broadway. <laughs> um, we shut down our senses in modern life. And to be right. able to wake them back up again just feels, makes us feel alive, makes us feel better. Right. That makes sense. And I saw something in, uh, you know, some piece of research you cited that, the sympathetic neural activity, I think it was re reduced by six, seven percent re reduction they'd found in you know this sympathetic activation. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and now there have been even more studies showing uh, better blood sugar regulation. You know, okay. after kind of regular walks outside, um, reduced feelings. I thought this was really interesting, especially after the pandemic. Reduced feelings of loneliness uh, oh. after feeling connected to nature. Um, so interesting, right? It's yeah. And, and what I also found interesting was the research you cited on um, fractals, right? 
talk to us about that like what is a fractal for people who aren't familiar and then you know how sure. that relates to what you're talking about sure well in the book i sort of i end up going through all those senses because i'm curious to know why we feel so much better when we're outside and what i found is that different scientists have their own pet theories about it so you know there's the smell guy uh, who i mentioned um um there are you know psychologists who are convinced it's about the color green does something to to sort of make us feel safe because we can, you know, in our deep evolutionary past, feel like we can find resources we need in a green environment. Um, but there are these physicists too, who say, I oh, don't know, no, it's actually about the fractal patterns that we see in the natural world that change our brain patterns. Um, so a, a, a fractal pattern is a pattern that repeats at different scales. Um, so, for example, you know, cloud formations, coastlines, um, waves and ripples in a stream, um, trees, uh, forests, you know, especially if you picture, you know, a forest in the winter, um, you get these, you know, patterns on the leaves, you get them on the twigs, you get them on the branches, and then you get them in the forest as a whole. So our brains, according to the neuroscience, our brains do engage in a really positive way when we're seeing these fractals. Um, and, you know, if you remember those screensavers, right, from, from the 90s, you know, that mm -hmm. go like that, um, they kind of do, they, they're, they're calming and they're kind of, um, you know, relaxing. So, um, yeah, so that's, when, oh, oh and, and I guess, you know, one of the guys who, one of the physicists who kind of has, has done some research with this also discovered that Jackson Pollock painted in fractal patterns and mm. um you know there was something about him in particular he was really attuned to these patterns that are found in nature and people who have tried to imitate jackson pollock's um have not been successful actually in 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 making fractal patterns on the canvas and so it's one of the ways they were using to find fakes which i think is really interesting oh fascinating right yeah but that also struck, struck me as something that's having immediate practical ac application. I mean, all of us could seek to make our workplaces more full of fractional patterns, you know, in the, in the art that we choose, our homes or our workplaces. And, and, and just more, like biophilic, a win, right? more biophilic in general, you know, mm. if we bring more houseplants in, if we work by a window where we can look out onto fractal patterns, see the sky, see some trees. Um, you know, there are there are many ways that we can make our indoor environments um, more conducive to feeling some of these restorative effects. Right, right. Um, yeah. And then so so you started with your research in Japan and that was and actually before I read your book, I the only research I was familiar with was that which had been done in Japan. But it turns out we've been doing it in Europe. I mean, even on, on my dual stop it dual step in Scotland. So yeah, so tell us a bit more about your, your sort of adventures in Europe and what we're discovering over yeah, here. Yeah, so um, I was really interested to spend some time in uh, Wales and um, in Scotland. I went to a forest preschool <laughs> that I visited there. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of data coming out of these forest preschools, you know, that the kids who go through these programs, um, and by the way, in Scandinavia, it's about one in 10 kids. So it's pretty common, mm -hmm. um, you know, that they end up, um, a little bit behind their peers on measures of reading and writing, you know, in, until about third grade when they go to, you know, conventional classrooms and sort of catch up. But they're ahead of their peers and they stay ahead of their peers on measures of social and emotional regulation. Um, they're healthier in terms of their um, microbacteria on their skin, for example. They're less likely to get colds. They're less likely to have asthma. Um, they perform really well in groups and in teams. Um, they seem to have more self-esteem as leaders. Um, they are curious about the world around them and they're encouraged to learn through exploration. So this one forest school I visited in Scotland, um, someone found a dead frog, you know, in the, in the forest. And so the curriculum that day was um, creating a, a sort of lovely nature funeral for the frog and talking about cycles of life and death. 
And, you know, as you can imagine, the kids are fully engaged <laughs> in this. Um, they are jumping in puddles and they're climbing trees and um, they're counting pebbles. And, you know, even though it seems like sometimes a harsh environment because it's rainy and cold <laughs> often in Scotland and Scandinavia, um, you know, the kids are kind of learning to help build fires and they're popping popcorn in the fires and um, they're even helping saw rough parts of down trees to make them friendlier to play on. Um, so they're, they're kind of learning to use real tools and um, yeah, they seem like they're really having a great time. I felt guilty as a mother, you know, that my kids didn't go. I was the same because I was kind of getting familiar with some of this research as my kids are in a, you know, a box all day. So yeah, I had similar, similar feelings. Yeah. Um, but that, yeah, which just, but does motivate me to get them out much more weekends. But, yeah. you know, for adults too, there's just, just a lot of emerging science. So in yeah. Finland, um, some research has found that people who spend a minimum of five hours a month outside in nature spaces, which, you know, equates to about 30 or 40 minutes twice a week, those people can prevent mild depression. Yeah. Um, they feel more optimistic. They have a better uh, sense of uh, energy and invigoration uh, in their lives. And um, since then, uh, there's been another study in the UK showing that two hours, a uh, let's, what is it? Two hours a week of time outside. So eight hours a month, you people in the UK seem to need a little more nature because <laughs> maybe you're more stressed out than people in Finland. But that two hours a week is kind of the sweet spot for um, psychological and physical health. Right. And that's in nature. Yes, but nature sort of broadly defined, right? So it can be coastlines, um, you know, green areas, um, gardens. Uh, there, are, there are lots of ways to define nature. Uh, it doesn't have to be you know, the Rocky Mountains, which is... And do, do parks count? Yeah. Yeah. And, and well, I found some interesting study, some research you cited in Glasgow, right? But, but the state of the park matters, right? How wasn't so there's some research they looked at where if the park wasn't well kept? Yes, because um, some of these parks in Glasgow were, had been sort of taken over by hoodlums. You know, there was drug dealing and... Um, um, you know, lighting the wheelie bins on fire and stuff like that. And so just a lot of people didn't go to the, the parks. They didn't feel safe or friend, you know, they didn't feel like friendly spaces. Um, and women especially will, will not go into parks uh, by themselves unless they feel safe. And so um, one of the experiments in Scotland has been to improve the quality uh, and safety of some of these wood lots. Uh, and then, uh, you know, uh, and, and they're measuring how people feel now in those spaces. So I think that's really interesting science. And um, it, it looks like the, the beneficial effects are especially salient for people at the lower ends of the socioeconomic status. So wealthy people in general have a lot of other resources. Um, you know, they can afford great health care. They can afford to belong to the golf club. They can afford living in neighborhoods that have wonderful, you know, courtyards and things like that. Um, but you see these huge benefits for uh, people who live in public housing, where the public housing is closer to green space. Um, it's the equivalent of making more money if you live on a block with a lot of trees uh, or near a park. So right. they call yeah. it like an equigenic effect. It helps equalize. The benefits for people right right and I, and I saw something that just just living near a park even if you don't use it has some benefit right yes that's right which is which i thought was extraordinary fascinating to delve into into why that yeah, is. who knows what that's about it could be partly about uh buffering noise pollution buffering air yeah. pollution um views out the window which we also have data on for helping people feel yeah. stress reduction yeah 
The other thing I took away from the book, which made total sense to me, was this, this forecasting error we make when it comes to spending time in nature. Could you tell us about that? Yes, there was a study uh, at the University of Toronto uh, in Canada um, asking students to uh, predict how happy they would feel after walking across campus through trees and grass or walking across campus through the underground tunnels. And, um, and then they kind of measured, you know, their state of minds before and after. And, uh, you know, it turns out that people felt much better after walking outside <laughs> it, it, amongst the trees, but they didn't predict that. Right. And so sometimes I think we, we sort of discount, you know, the really beneficial effects that nature can give us. Uh, and we tend to overcount, um, you know, watching TV or um, eating ice cream. Uh, I mean, those things are nice too, but, but it turns out nature has a huge impact on us. Yeah. yeah. And we're just not very good. I think, well, we're not very good at predicting how we'll feel, but we're also not very good at asking ourselves and tuning in. How do I feel after that walk? Mm. And so I really encourage people to do that. You know, if you are spending time outside, check in with yourself and see if you felt better, you know, than when you started. Um, notice which features of nature make you feel the best. So for some people, it may be bodies of water. You know, for other people, um, it may be, um, you know, a, a clear golf, golf lawn, um, or it may be a forest, or it may be spending time with flowers, um, you know, in a greenhouse. So just cue in a little bit, notice, stop and notice which are the parts of nature that make me happiest. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, yeah, that, that makes sense to me. And, and also what I found armed with that knowledge is if I, if, if the voice in my head, oh, it's rainy or it's windy, it's, it's, it's like, yeah, but you, you're going to get benefit of it. It's, it's more like treating it like a vitamin pill or some medicine or something like turn off the part of you that says, oh yeah, but I might not like it. And just really remind myself, no, no, this is you know, very good for me. Well, that's a good point because one of the studies took place in Michigan in the winter um, when it was blustery and cold and people really didn't want to go outside. Um, but it, after they went, it turns out <laughs> Their short-term memory was better, um, and their um, let's see what else was better. Their like attention to tasks, uh, they performed better on certain tests. So, you know, there are these benefits even when we don't feel like it's so beneficial. Yeah, and I thought that's a really, really important important finding is almost like treat it like a green juice you might not like it while it lasts but... exactly it's like broccoli <laughs> yeah. broccoli yeah there we go right. but i think we've also all had that experience of like not wanting to go outside when it's raining or something and yeah. then after 10 or 15 minutes like you know we don't want to come home i mean it's great yeah yeah exactly and it's interesting i'll do that with my kids i'll be like i don't care you're going outside get your wellies on uh it's it's learning to do that for myself yeah, we call that motivational inertia, right? It's like it's we just don't want to make the transition, but right. Once we do, we're like, oh yeah, okay. Yeah, exactly. Uh yeah. And of course, we're also, I mean, that was the other interesting part of your 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 research is that we've of course become that motivational inertia is exacerbated, presumably, by just how entertaining our devices now are, right? Totally. Uh, I, I saw something stag I was sharing this in the office before we came on from the book. But um, Paul actually, husband of Ruth Anne actually, who's been on the show, um, was citing some research. Thirty-six percent of people check their phones while having sex. Yeah, that I also I also heard that we check our email seventy-four times a day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's just it's. I yeah. And, and I guess, and, and being in nature, and that's another important part, Paul, right? We, we, it's no good. I remember Ruth saying this when she was on the show. It's no good being in nature with your tech, right? It, to get the effects, you've got to, as much as possible, leave the tech at home, right? Yeah, I, so I think that's a little bit debatable. Um, it depends how you're using the phone. Um, I think we've also found that, you know, 
people like taking photos, uh, of course, on their phones. Uh, well, we know for Instagram, but but also sometimes to help identify, you know, a particular plant or bug or something like that. Um, it can, in some ways, maybe help cue us into beauty if we know we're taking a picture of something. Um, but if you're, you know, we, we also have studies showing that if you're on the phone or if you're texting, you are not paying attention to what's around you. Mm. So uh, one study showed that people who were on the phone while walking across an arboretum um, noticed as little in the arboretum as people who didn't take the walk at all. So when they were asked to recall what they saw, they it was like they hadn't even taken the walk. Right. <laughs> yeah. So take your phone, but not at the expense of paying attention to what's around you. Put it in your back pocket and only pull it out occasionally. If you want to, if you want to <laughs> discover if that mushroom's edible. <laughs> exactly. Well, even there, be very careful. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting my kids. That's one of the things I've found actually a great way to engage my kids is getting them mushroom hunting. And it's, it's, can we eat this one, Daddy? Can we eat that? I love mushroom hunting. I'm, so I'm with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, fantastic. Um, well, the other thing, which I have to say, I've not read your book on heartbreak, but as you were saying before we came on, it, it, took the, it has some links. So I wonder if uh, yeah. we, we could explore a little bit, you know, what you, you know, the story of, of that book and, you know, yeah. how you come to write a book about heartbreak and, and perhaps some of the links to, to nature and how it can help. Yeah. Thanks so much for asking me about that. Um, the book just came out last year and it's really about um, my experience of a really difficult divorce after a 25 year marriage. Um, and so I became much more interested in grief and trauma and how to recover from that. I, I do talk about that a little bit in the nature fix book. I have a chapter, for example, on veterans, uh, you know, who have post-traumatic stress. Um, but, but for the heartbreak book, I, I just dove much deeper into that. And, um, you know, talked quite a bit about what grief does to our bodies physically. Um, I got sick, uh, you know, after the divorce and my immune system really changed. And I was very curious to know why, what was going on? Why did I feel so anxious and sort of hyper vigilant? Uh, and it turns out that, you know, when we feel rejected uh, or sort of ostracized um, or, you know, we've lost love or lost an attachment bond it makes us feel very vulnerable because we associate attachments from our deep evolutionary past, right, with safety. And so our bodies in some ways respond as if we've been kind of left alone on the savanna and we become very kind of conscious of danger. Um, and so that's, that's not great for our immune systems, you know, when it persists, uh, increases inflammation. I actually checked my... Um, uh, immune cell markers, checked my genetic markers, uh, transcription factors in my immune system to see how they were changing over time after the divorce and to see if there was anything I could do to make myself and my cells, um, you know, return to normal. Uh, and so one of the things I did really the heart of that book, the heartbreak book is a 30 day trip into the wilderness. Um, uh, wow. In the Nature Fix, I wrote about the three-day effect, you know, which is that magical things start to happen to us kind of emotionally uh, after three days uh, outside. But, but I felt like, okay, I need a lot more than three days <laughs> to get over this. I need 30 35 more. years. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It might take as long to get over it as you did. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I spent 30 days in the wilderness. And, and um, tw 12 of those days I did totally alone, like a solo trip. Um, to see if I could go really deep into kind of a, a sense of healing. Um, and, you know, again, measured my cells kind of before and after uh, that trip. It, it turns out actually that the solo trip did not make me feel safer. It did not change my immune cells, although it was an interesting exercise in terms of learning how to meditate and right. sort of quiet my mind and doing a lot of deep reflection. But being alone in the wilderness uh, you know, is, is you're, you're actually literally doing what your brain thinks you're doing when you've been divorced, which is that you feel like you're alone in the wilderness. So it's actually being with other people in the wilderness is a better strategy 
uh, if you feel lonely and rejected, it turns out. So that was good to learn. Right. Right. That sounds like a very stoic way of putting it. <laughs> did, 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 did it get pretty dark then when you were like on this trip or? Yeah, it kind yeah. of did. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was beautiful and I felt, I felt empowered by it. You know, I came out of it feeling like I can take care of myself. I can be kind of a, a badass. I can like paddle mm. canoe through the wilderness and I can row my own boat. You know, that's an important mm. metaphor. Um, but I also cycled into some dark places, you know, um, mentally because there, I didn't have any friends, you know, mm. there to kind of tell me, Florence, don't be ridiculous. Like you're great, you know, and mm. your ex-husband's a loser. And, you know, there, there was none of that kind of, um, mediating force that our friends are so good at, um, you know, there's a reason we like living in society and it's, it's because it doesn't let us cycle into these dark, ruminating places that we tend to go to alone. Yeah. And that, that resonates with my own experience of my own grief work is, in the end, I've had to do it by myself, but it's always been with the help of a, of a therapist or, yeah, some, there's, there's, a, there's a sort of, a, I've always done my most powerful healing work with a witness, yes. a companion. And it makes us feel less alone just to know mm. that these are shared experiences. Sometimes when you're going through a traumatic event, you don't know other people going through it at the same time. Um, for me, like all my close friends were still married. Um, but everyone goes through it sooner or later, right? Right. Everyone yeah. goes through heartbreak sooner or later. It's an experience everyone has eventually, um, you know, some kind of heartbreak or another. Yeah. Um, or difficult times. And so by being vulnerable and talking about my own, you know, difficulty through this, I was able to really connect, you know, in a very meaningful way um, with people who could help me and had been through it also. Right. And so if the time in the wilderness alone didn't work, what did work? Yeah, good question. Um, so uh, I'd say time in nature with friends was really great. Right. Uh, so I, I did that a ton. Um, I talk a lot in the book about the power of awe, how we can uh, develop a keener ability to see beauty around us. And we know that people who can do that people who can cultivate awe, cultivate beauty are actually more resilient people. Uh, and that was a huge lesson from the book. So it became my project to become more attuned to the awe and beauty around me as a way to heal. Uh, and I, I talk a lot about that science in the book and a lot about how I did it, but, but mostly it was, you know, through learning how to become a little more mindful, um, you know, really making an effort to kind of notice things around me, um, to put myself in the way of beauty as well. Right. Um, and then, um, you know, to really savor, savor that and, and feel when, when, when we feel awe, you know, we feel like we're connected to a larger world. We feel like our own problems are less significant. Uh, at one point I was walking through the woods and I was kind of, you know, thinking something, you know, kind of disturbing and distracting. And all of a sudden this great horned owl like flew right in front of me on the path. And I was like, oh, you know, that kind of like awe yeah. face that people get. Yeah. It's like, you know, your eyebrows go up and, you know, it immediately takes you out of whatever it is you're thinking of. Whatever that yeah. was becomes completely unimportant. You're just blown away by this force in front of you and um um you know different psychologists talk about this as being kind of an unselfing where our ego becomes a little bit less important in those moments very very significant uh for our mental health to feel like oh yeah there's a world outside of my head and it's an incredible world and i want to see it right yeah that, and it, and and I'm guessing there's a relationship with there to the extent of you, we need to feel safe enough 
that we're open to sort of surrender to the to this awe. Yes, uh, safety is a very important part of healing. Um, yeah. But I think being in nature and feeling connected to it can also help us feel safer, right? Because it yeah. helps calm our nervous systems down in that way. Um, but you know, it, my project to kind of find awe took me in some interesting directions. So, for example, I did some psychedelic therapy because there has been some research suggesting that the pathway for why psychedelics can be so helpful for some people after trauma is because it puts them in an awe state. Okay. So, uh, you know, they're seeing, you know, the connections of the universe, right? And, and I had a very powerful and beautiful experience taking psilocybin, you know, which is uh, magic mushrooms, basically, um, where, uh, you know, I saw myself as a tree. <laughs> And um, I saw my ex as a, a constricting vine around right. my trunk. And I had this very powerful realization that I needed to unwind him really from my heart in order to grow into this beautiful tree that I wanted to become. <laughs> And then, you know, I also felt like I was like one particle of light amongst millions of other particles of light in the universe. And we're all made of molecules. You know, it was like, it was profound and um, very helpful. It ended up being one of the most helpful things I did because it made me feel less afraid of the future. Um, and it helped me, I think, separate, you know, from this. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And what a beautiful tree you are. Thank you. <laughs> And still growing, right? <laughs> still growing. Yes. Yeah, that's that's really powerful. And did you find after that experience then that your facility then to be in awe was was increased then? You could kind of get into that groove more easily. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I try I, I try I tried and still try to sort of recapture some sense of that through meditation. Right. So I have deepened my own meditation practice. Um since, you know, the heartbreak, but also, especially since that experience, because it is known to be one of the ways you can kind of, um, you know, attenuate the effects, um, or elongate the effects, um, of feeling connected to, mm. to the world around you. I think that's one of the, you know, deepest benefits of meditation, right. Is this sense of unity and belonging, um, that we can find. Yeah. Yeah, and just as you described that, I think yeah, I I, I resonate a lot with that because I, I meditate you know twice a day and yeah, oh, I feel that all. But I have to say that the most that there's a, I went on a canoeing trip with my kids recently and and we caught we at dawn we caught this bar, barn owl hunting, and me and my son were both like yeah. So there is I'm not sure I've ever quite reached that same level of wow uh, in meditation right. There's the, there's right. certainly something special about yeah, just being in, in, in those sort of peak nature moments. But I think there are lots of ways to find awe, you know, I mm. mean, obviously I'm a fan of nature, but you know, whatever it is that makes you feel mm. wowed and it may be a symphony or it may be looking at, uh, art, you know, um, it may be watching your children, you know, do something amazing. Yeah. Um, it may be through religion. Um, but I think going in pursuit of awe and even trying to do it a little bit every day has been shown to really improve your mood, um, again, your sense of loneliness, um, your, um, it reduces symptoms of pain, it's finding sort of daily awe, um, reduces symptoms of anxiety and depression. So, you know, you can make it a little practice to just every day say, I'm going to find something beautiful today and I'm right. just going to sit with it for a few breaths. Like that's it. Mm. It's just like a one minute practice, but uh, it's been shown in studies to really have significant effects. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's, that's pretty. And is that something you now do? Is that a practice you have? Uh, as yeah, well as I practice? actually joined a study um, called the Northfield awe study uh, where I did that practice twice a day. And then kind of on an app and my phone, I would sort of like report my mood and my symptoms and stuff like that. Um, 
And that study has been analyzed now. And, and I think there's something like a, you know, 20 or 30% improvement in people's symptoms on average uh, after six weeks of this. But, but the interesting thing is that after doing that for six weeks, I, I felt like I was able to just now naturally notice beauty more, more readily around me. So after like really trying to look for it, now I'm just better at seeing it when it's there. Right. That would make sense after six weeks. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So totally but like one or two minutes a day, like, you know. Yeah. And I immediately go to, well, imagine if we were doing that in our workplaces or in schools or right. What a difference that might make. Exactly. Exactly. We just mm. don't experience awe as a species as much as we used to. You know, we used to right. look at the Milky Way every night. We used yeah. to come face to face with wild animals. We used to see the sunset. We used to see the moon. Um, we don't experience awe as much. And we are a species that evolved to experience this. And mm. it has helped us cohere, you know, as groups. It has helped us feel optimistic, you know. Um, so the lack of it is something I think about a lot, actually. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and it would make sense that we would have to kind of retrain ourselves yeah. to find it and seek it and experience it enough that we feel compelled to seek more of it, right? Exactly. Exactly. And, and it's linked to resilience, you know? So if we care about preventing mental health problems or helping manage them, um, this is, I think, a really important idea that doesn't get a lot of airplay and it should. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, having done this, you know, having done hundreds of podcasts and we've, you know, many, many of which have been devoted to healing and, and wellness and so on. Yeah. This is, this specific topic of all has, has not come up. It's interesting. It's, it is interesting to me. I'm and curious, it, Richard, how, how you have changed some of your practices since reading the book. Yeah. So that's right. So definitely trying the, the Cypress oil. Yeah. Which I love. And I can, I have some sense of an effect. As I say, I've just got to, um, <laughs> Do, like, do I have this mister on with earplugs in so I can actually get to sleep? Or do I like find a quieter one? But at the moment, I'm like, you know, there's this trade off right now between this having the thing going and being able to get sleep, um, which I'm sure I'll figure out. Well, I don't think, I don't think the Hinoki cypress oil is supposed to calm you down, actually. I don't think that's a good one for sleep. I think it's supposed to make you feel a little invigorated, actually. So oh, really? Maybe I've when got you're the sitting way. at the desk and you're trying to wake up, that's a good time to do it. Oh, damn. I've got the wrong oil. There you I go. I misread the, the I thought. This. Anyway, um, so there's, there's that. The, yeah, the other thing is, is, is this forecasting error point, right? Like really training myself to um, counter that thought of, oh, it's rainy, it's wet, or oh, I'm tired, or oh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like treating it like, it's important I go to the gym. It's important I get my, you know, I get my vitamins. It's, so re really relating to it in that way um, is, is a new behavior. And like, so, so one of the that's manifested in is, is like deliberately walking to get my coffee, which is at, in, the, in the town that I'm working in now. It's at the other end of the park. So I, I walk through the park to get to Great. the coffee stall to get yeah. the coffee, right? Because, you know, based on the evidence in your book, I know that even... 10 or 15 minutes, which that requires walking through a park is going to give me some benefit. And have you noticed that you feel differently walking through the park than walking on the busy street? Well, that's, that's a good, that, that is something I'm learning from this podcast, actually. It's something I'm not doing and I yeah. can see there might be benefit in is pausing and yeah. asking myself, oh, okay, how did that feel walking through the park versus, uh, yeah, walking along the street? Like, okay, or, well, you'll have to self-experiment. Yeah. Or, and, and what, uh, or what do I like about the park? Is it the fact, it, am I engaged with the pigeons? Is it the trees? Is it the grass? Is it the flowers? Like though that, that kind of reflection I'm not doing, I'm just like forcing well, myself to actually walk through the park. I think we can also talk about ways to maximize the benefits of that walk through the park. Because it, like yeah. I said, if you're, you know, if you're listening to, uh, your headphones and you're thinking about your to-do list while you're walking through the park, um, you're sort of crushing yourself a little bit there. Mm. So if you, if you need the restoration and you want the restoration, the key, the secret to sort of the shortcut 
of benefits is to is to really make an effort to cue into your senses. Mm-hmm. So the next time you walk through the park, you know, ask yourself a couple things like, what birds am I hearing? Yeah. Like, and how many how many birds am I hearing? Um, I wonder if I can find some fractal patterns, you know, in these trees mm-hmm. around me. Um, you know, um, does it make sense to stop for a moment and pick pick some leaves? or some pine needles around you and smell them as you're walking. Like that is a shortcut right there to a change in mood. So, um, and then like maybe even taking a moment to sort of close your eyes for a second and just feel what the breeze is doing. Where, where is that breeze hitting your body? Um, take a couple of deep breaths while you're there. That is just a way to like really amplify those benefits in a very limited amount of time. Yeah. No, I think that's that's going to be the next, yeah, the next move for me is to is to really yeah try that. I, I and I think because I'm not doing this in response to like feeling depressed or stressed or anything. I mean, I live a pretty healthy life. I feel good ninety nine percent of the time. It's like this is almost like adding on top. So it's like, how do I develop that practice of, as you say, like really savoring it and 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 I'm really intrigued by this ability to experience awe. I, I, I do experience awe in my life, but I, I don't train myself to experience it more and more. And I can imagine the impact. Where do you most experience it? Do you think? So I do experience sometimes in, my, in meditation. And like I say, there's sometimes in nature, it seems particularly barn owls. Like I live in an area where we, <laughs> I don't know if you have barn owls where you live, but they're, they're just yeah. they're ghostly white. They're silent. They're absolutely. Owls are amazing. Beautiful, <laughs> beautiful to experience. And they've yeah. got these big round face uh so yeah so i i definitely get it when i watch barn house hunt um but uh without fail but yeah that so that's so i i and had your books helped me to kind of recognize that that is what i'm experiencing and having a label for it and yes i mean or so uh right. yeah nice. i think um finding that time in nature uh and yeah and as i say med- i think meditation is uh, uh, yeah amazing for me but one of the points that you make in your book is it's something what was it like 10 percent or 15 percent of people stick with meditation so it's that's yeah. that's not like available for most and it wasn't available for me for my entire 20s and most of my 30s right. it took me like over a decade of trying to get into meditation and failing right before i got into it uh but walking in the park is walking in the park we could do yeah exactly and then, you know, the more we do it, I think just the better we get at noticing mm. um, what's around us uh, and, you know, really kind of enjoying watching the change in the seasons um, or, you know, the change in the light. Um, even in a city, you know, we can often look up at the sky and see what the clouds are doing, you know, see what the sunset is doing. These aren't these aren't things we we do enough and they're helpful. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, is there anything that uh, you've you've discovered that we've not touched on uh, that you'd like to share with the audience? Um, I wonder if I have any more t- just user friendly tips. I think we've said a lot of them. Um, you know, one thing I, I do talk quite a bit about in the book are the benefits of nature sounds. So, you know, if you find yourself kind of stressed out um, and you're indoors, even uh, you know, just playing some bird song or listening to the sound of rain. You know, it's so easy to to find soundtracks for these kinds of things now. Yeah, uh, I think that's a, a really nice tip. And then I also love, uh, you know, taking snacks or meals outside, and uh, you know, just getting a little more daylight, you know, into your eyes, and and again, kind of looking up at the sky, take taking taking some deep breaths out there as we or before we eat is really good for digestion. You know, anything we can do to kind of help shift our uh, nervous system is going to be good, good for digestion. So, so, you know, sometimes going outside and sitting someplace quiet, finding a park bench or or a stoop or something like that. Um, And then, you know, I think walking in the morning daylight or going outside in, in early morning daylight has been shown to be really helpful for resetting our circadian rhythms so that we sleep better at night. Uh, and, and we also just feel a little more, um, awake, you know, for the tasks we have to do during the day. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, no, brilliant. Um, yeah, fantastic. Uh, ton of great tips there. Um, something else I came across that I don't know if you've 
got any experience with, but there's a guy creating forest indoor forest bathing experiences, right? Where they'll bring trees and, and like bark and, and, and they're making installations in hotels and, and so on. And uh, I'm really excited for the future there. Like how much if we can bring this wisdom and this knowledge and redesign our office spaces, you know, because it's great that, you know, obviously we can get outside and we can explore all those benefits, but how much of this can we also bring inside is really intriguing. To yeah. Me. The reality is we do have to spend much of our lives inside, but I also would encourage us to not just replace the outside yeah. <laughs> with the inside because there are more benefits to actually having that light and feeling the breeze. Yeah, yeah. like we'll, ne we'll never we'll never replace it, right? It'll, exactly. it'll never replace it. That's right. Okay, well, awesome. So um, we'll put links to both The Nature Fix and Heartbreak, a personal and scientific journey um, in the description uh, for the show. Any Anywhere else you would send people if you've been inspired? Um, yeah, if people want to find out more about my uh, retreats or talks or things like that, um, uh, my website is just florencewilliams.com. Brilliant. Okay. I'm on Instagram. I'm easy to find. Fantastic. Well, thanks again, Florence. This has been amazing. Uh, yeah, keep up the great work. Uh, yeah, you've certainly inspired me. I'm hoping this will inspire many more. Uh, yes, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Richard. Thank you.